Hello there folks, I'm Dan Brown from sortofinteresting.com and today you are joining me on board good old narrowboat Abel's Ark and I am absolutely over the moon to be able to say that today you're joining me for part one of my brand new completely free audiobook. This is the audio version of a book that I've been writing throughout 2018 all about my return to boat life and getting settled on board and being back on the canals where I belong. So I hope that you'll enjoy this. This is going to be an ongoing monthly series. I'm not only posting this audio version that you're about to hear completely free for everyone to tune into, but I'm also posting the actual written version over on the website at sortofinteresting.com. Now, obviously, by giving this away completely free, I'm missing out on a potential huge amount of sales here. And traditionally, book sales have been what's ultimately financed and funded a lot of the YouTube channel and all these videos and all the rest of it. So I've got a completely optional Patreon that I finally set up to support this project. Thank you very much to those of you who've already gone over and supported me on Patreon before even this first episode's gone online, which is incredible, so thank you very much. Um, it's patreon.com forward slash sort of interesting. As I say, if you support me over there, that's fantastic and I can't tell you how grateful I am. If not, then this audiobook and everything is still completely available, completely free to everybody. Another way that you can support me and help me out if you would like to is to check out my existing Kindle books about boat life. And there's also a short audiobook I also recorded in the past, along with a paperback collection of some of the shorter Kindle books, all in one handy volume. Um, ultimately, though, as I say, please do check the links in the description to find my books on Amazon and check out the Patreon if you so wish. It really does help me out and it really would um, mean a lot to me. But as I say, if not, I hope you enjoy this audiobook going forwards as well. So without further ado, I should explain this is my new book, part one. This is The Call of the Canal, the book title by myself, Daniel Mark Brown. And well, as I say, I think after two minutes of waffling, let's get some boating footage on the screen. I'm going to get out of here and leave you to part one of the audiobook. So obviously part two will be up in the near future. Um, part one is all about sort of uh, leaving boat life and getting to grips with land life or failing to get to grips with land life and then getting out there and looking for a new boat. And in part two, we'll be going straight into getting settled and getting stuck back into boat life. So I hope you'll tune in in the future. As I say, links in the description. I'd be hugely grateful, but ultimately just enjoy the audiobook. Until the next time, my friends, have an absolutely fantastic day. Keep it interesting, keep it boat-worthy, and of course, my friends, farewell. The Call of the Canal by Daniel Mark Brown Chapter 1 A Second Chance On Sunday the 5th of June 2016, I stood on board Narrowboat Tilly for the final time. Tilly, a small 30-foot long boat, had been my home for roughly four fantastic years, which I had enjoyed immensely, but with a heavy heart I had finally come to terms with the fact that, for a variety of reasons, my narrowboat life experience had reached an end. It had been a mixture of stereotypical canal beauty, often a fun way to live, sometimes challenging and certainly an experience that had taught me a lot about life in general, but it had finally come to a close. Or so I thought. On Thursday the 19th of April 2018, I made an offer on a boat that was for sale in a local marina. Later that day I received a phone call congratulating me on having my offer accepted. Within 24 hours I had paid in full and had been back on board to start taking measurements to begin the moving in process. Before the paperwork had even been printed, yet alone finalised. I was keen to resume the lifestyle that I had given up forever less than two years earlier. On April the 29th, I had almost finished moving my furniture on board and spent my first night in my new home, overjoyed to be afloat on the canal once again. When I first sat down to write this book, I was still a little embarrassed to have left the canal forever, only to return within two years. 
I had originally written an introduction that tried to save face and explain away my change of heart. However, as the months have passed and this book has slowly come together, I realised that this book is entirely about my change of heart and how the lessons learnt during my years on a tiny narrowboat slowly brought me to a point where I realised that, although I had enjoyed life on a boat, I could, in hindsight, see how much better my life as a boater could have been. More importantly, I realised how much better my life on a boat still could be. Once I had accepted that my life on Tilly had not been the best of boat life, it was only a matter of time until I couldn't resist taking another attempt at narrowboat life. To reassure myself that it wasn't just a phase of longing for the canal, I deliberately delayed viewing any boats for over a month, but as the weeks passed by, I found that the call of the canal was an ever-present thought niggling away at me in the back of my mind. When I finally decided that it wasn't just a phase and that I was serious about the idea, I went to a marina without telling a soul so that I could tentatively view a few boats without any influence other than my own mind and heart. When I stepped on board a narrowboat for the first time in almost two years, it was barely a matter of seconds before I knew deep down that I could be very happy living on board again and that I had missed life afloat much more than I had realised, or maybe more than I had wanted to admit to myself. Now, as I type these words on board Abel's Ark, moored only one bridge away from where I handed over the keys for narrowboat Tilly, I feel like the luckiest person on earth, or water. The peaceful nature of life on a canal boat is exemplified by this exact moment on a cold November night. The coals on the fire are glowing the unmistakably warm orange glow that keeps the chill of the outdoors at bay, and there are a few logs sat next to the fire, ready to be thrown in before I head off to bed. At shoulder height to my right, I know that if I raise the blind, then the window will act as a picture frame onto a dark, still and silent scene of glass-like water, together with the silhouette of a hedgerow on the far bank, beneath an immaculate, cloudless sky. With such little light pollution in areas such as here in rural Shropshire on the Welsh border, the winter constellations are only a small part of the scattered stars on display. I may have been away for two years, but it has not dulled my enduring love of the countryside, nature, or this interesting and enjoyable way of life. After two long years of living in a fixed abode, it is good to finally be home. Chapter 2. The Ghost of Boat Life Past As I mentioned in the introduction, I was lucky enough to spend four years living on a boat from 2012 until 2016, before I then moved back to my hometown of Oswestry until buying Abel's Ark in 2018. Although I don't want to dwell on the past, well, the present and the future hold so much great potential, it is important to briefly summarise my time on the canals, as well as dry land, to fully understand the significance of my return to narrowboat life. When I had first bought Narrowboat Tilly at the age of 25, I had been excited, impatient and filled with joy at the prospect of getting afloat. I had been living at home with my mum for the years prior to even having the idea of living on a boat. Once I had made up my mind that it was something that I really wanted to do, I eagerly started to save. My intention originally being to buy a boat that would likely have been similar to the one I am currently sat on, 45 feet long, with a sensible amount of living space, together with all the basic things that I would need to live a comfortable life. As time wore on, I found myself increasingly impatient. Not that I was unhappy with the way life was. I was extremely active, walking and cycling thousands of miles a year, going camping, climbing mountains, and spending a lot of time sleeping on my friends' sofas and floors, despite having a perfectly good bed at my mum's house. Everything was good. I just couldn't resist the temptation of the boat life carrot that was dangling in front of my face, but just out of reach. After around two years or so of saving, my impatience, 
or as I like to call it, excitement, got the better of me. I started looking at ever smaller, cheaper boats and finally started to go and view some of them with my friends. I settled on a 30 foot long boat called Tilly and on the 24th of July 2012 I signed the papers and became a boat owner. Little did I realise just what I had let myself in for. Boat life would be an experience that would shape me in ways that I couldn't have ever predicted. Tilly would teach me a new level of living an active lifestyle, along with a new understanding of simple living. It would also be during my time on Tilly that my long-standing love of writing and making videos for YouTube would finally find an audience that would help guide me and teach me, and in many ways make me grow up. I won't go into too much detail about Tilly as many readers or listeners will be familiar with my previous books on boat life and the hundreds of videos that I have made on board, but with only 15 feet of her total length being indoor space, it was certainly a simple setup. I had a wet room, shower and toilet, a living room that also doubled up as a bedroom which consisted of some cupboards, fireplace and the sofa bed a simple kitchen and a desk to sit and write and edit my videos at. But at the time that I moved on board it was fantastic and served my needs perfectly. Not only did Tilly offer me all the basics of life but she also had one hugely important bonus at that point in my life. She was cheap and I could afford to move on board immediately. So that is exactly what I did. The years seemed to pass quickly on Tilly in a blur of boating, cycling, walking, writing and looking at the stars in an amazingly rural dark sky environment. At first it was fantastic, the sheer excitement of being on a boat counteracted any negatives or worries or anxious moments that I had on board. After four years however, I found that during the final winter, which was an historically wet one in the UK, I began to feel slightly downcast. The hundreds of miles of cycling to and from work in the rain, the constant condensation and wet clothes drying over the fireplace on board, and the toll this was having on my enthusiasm led me to reluctantly decide to bring boat life to an end. I had initially thought about a complete renovation of Tilly, then looked at buying a new boat, but as I pedalled and walked down the muddy towpaths in the dark nights and mornings of winter, I knew my heart wasn't really in it, so without too much of a fight I moved back to dry land and sold Tilly to somebody that has since given her the TLC that she badly needed. Moving back onto dry land was a huge change for me. After living a rough and ready lifestyle on a boat for four years, I decided to treat myself and rented out a flat on the top floor of a lovely converted old building in my hometown of Oswestry. It was fitted out in a sleek modern style, had all kinds of luxuries that had been a distant dream during my boat life, such as a dishwasher, which I never actually used. Instead, I turned it into a glorified cupboard to store my crockery. It was only a one-bedroomed place, but cost me the same as what some multi-bedroomed houses in the area would have been. The reason that I considered it a treat, and that it commanded such a price, was due to the top floor location, with a huge living room complete with patio doors which opened up onto a small balcony that overlooked Oswestry and the surrounding countryside in the distance. Another key feature of the building was the security. To get into my flat you had to pass through a coded gate, then through a door opened by an NFC key fob before finally using a key to open my actual front door after you had climbed the five flights of steps or, of course, taken the lift. Despite the new experience of having my first dry land residence that wasn't shared with my family and the huge amount of living space compared to Narrowboat Tilly, along with the convenience of heating that would flick on with a switch, or the luxury of a huge shower and bath combination, I never really loved the flat in the way that I had loved life on Tilly. Even though the last six months on board were more than a little challenging, for the first few months my life on dry land was somehow even more rootless than my boat life had been. Even though I now lived in a fixed place with none of the worries of moving the boat and 
following the cruising rules, but I somehow find it hard to fully relax. Despite the fact that most of my family and friends, along with the store where I work, were less than a 10 minute walk away, making huge parts of my life far easier and more convenient than they had been compared to when I was floating around on a boat that could sometimes be a 15 mile bike ride away, I still find it difficult to settle. This ease and convenience of land life left me feeling like I had a lot more free time. Without the hours of commuting per week, life seemed almost too easy. I think that the lack of commuting and worrying about the boats left me feeling as if I hadn't done much of my day, even if I had done a full shift at work. I would simply walk home and instead of cycling miles out to a boat, I would be home, changed and have something cooking for tea within 15 minutes. This in turn pushed me to become ever more active. I found that the time I did spend on my bike or out walking was more enjoyable than it had been for a long time. On the boat, a walk or bike ride was often also a trip to the shops or, as mentioned above, a commute. On dry land, the only reason that I would be out cycling or walking would be just for the sheer enjoyment of doing it. At this point, some people may be thinking, but Dan, the reason you couldn't settle properly in the flat was because you really wanted to be on the canal all along. And that may well have subconsciously been the case. However, I had made my decision and I intended to give land life a good go. The months passed by much quicker than they seemed to on the boat. Probably because I wasn't planning my year and cruising plans around the seasons or changing the physical location of where my home was every two weeks. Months seemed to blur into one cloudy memory much easier than they had done in the previous four years. It took me at least the first six months to have the flat looking like anybody really lived there. Moving from tiny Tilly meant that I simply had little to no furniture. Luckily, the flat had come with the kitchen fully fitted out, or I would have probably been cooking on a camping stove for the duration of my life on dry land. I had two tub chairs, a desk, and my old bed that I took from my mum's house. As I slowly added another desk, some chests of drawers, a couple of lamps, and a small sofa to the flat, it at least started to look less like some kind of strange art exhibition depicting the futility of finding happiness in possessions. There was one thing that everybody who visited universally asked, where is your TV? It would ultimately take me the best part of a year to finally buy a television, at which point I went overboard, excuse the pun, and bought a fancy 4K one with lights built into the back of it. It was all very modern, yet I didn't actually have it connected to a TV aerial. I used it mainly as a big screen for my computer to watch YouTube and Netflix and occasionally to play a video game or two. Strangely, the television was not only the thing that I took longest to buy and the most considered decision, it also turned out to be the biggest waste of money. To be honest, there is very little more that I can really say about life in the flat. It was fine. I wasn't unhappy with it. I spent loads of time out walking and cycling and looking at the stars at night, and it was far more comfortable than life on Tilly. It was easier to see friends and family, and on more than one occasion I found myself in a relationship with a girl that got to the point of me thinking, this is it, before I, rightly or wrongly, find a reason that it wasn't it anymore. Had I not have got cold feet or maybe just given relationships more time or even just grown up, perhaps I would now be writing a book about my life with a wife and kids, but probably not. Ultimately though, as much as my life in the flat was fine, I started to become incredibly bored. Even the constant outdoor activity wasn't enough to keep me occupied. I started to build a model railway, which sometimes would see me work 10 hours or more a day on a tiny cardboard building for it, or hop on my bike and go for a 12 mile round trip to get more parts from a model shop near Chirk, where I had once moored up my previous narrowboat home. Even this new hobby couldn't keep me fully occupied. 
and for seemingly no sensible reason, I would find myself setting up unbelievably over-the-top lighting setups and constantly moving my furniture around. If I found myself at a loose end, there was a good chance that the living room, which I had turned into a living room slash bedroom slash office slash recording studio, would end up having a facelift. The strips of LED colour changing lighting was constantly being moved around to create ever more complex and futuristic lighting patterns, but really it was all just a big waste of time. This bored lighting rampage reached its height during the Christmas 2017 period, where I found myself dashing down to a local shop late at night to buy even more lights before they closed. By Christmas Day 2017, it had become obvious that something in my life needed to change, and to be honest, I had already thought about life on another boat on more than one occasion. By the start of 2018, even if I didn't realise it, it was already only a matter of time until I was back on the canal. Chapter 3. Finding the Ark At roughly 10.40am on March the 14th, 2018, I walked into the office at Blackwater Meadow Marina in Ellesmere. After a quick chat with some familiar faces that I had not seen since I left canal life, I was handed two sets of keys to take a look at the boats that I was interested in. I walked the short distance from the office to where the boats sat next to a wooden jetty behind the dry dock, almost holding my breath as, after months of speculating and delaying, the boat hunt was finally about to become very real, as I stepped on board a boat for the first time in almost two years. In my mind, it seems as if there was barely any time between my first thoughts about buying another boat and actually going out to view some. It was a genuine surprise to me when reviewing my photos of the time period and seeing that it was not until March that I actually set foot on board a potential floating home. The first thoughts of returning to boat life had crossed my mind in the run-up to the previous Christmas. I had certainly made inquiries online earlier than March, but... Nothing had interested me enough to entice me to go out and view it. Finally, I couldn't resist hopping on a bus to the local marina to view an ex-hire boat called Tilly Mint. At 45 feet long, the boat appeared to be much better suited to living on than Tilly had been, but I needed to step on board to see how I would truly feel about it. There was a similar boat also up for sale alongside it, so... I thought I might as well check that one out too. Stepping onto the stern of Tilly Mint, I was reassured by how steady it felt compared to the more prominent movement that my smaller lighter boat had had when shifting my weight around on board. I unlocked the stern door and stepped down into the small living room area and took a moment to glance around, viewing the kitchen ahead of me and the corridor down to the bedroom. In an instant, all my worries about returning to boat life vanished. I knew in those first few seconds that I could happily live on a boat again. I went on to spend around 40 minutes viewing the two boats, determined to walk away from the marina with nothing more than a lot of food for thought. I said my goodbyes, handed the keys in at the marina, and then caught the next bus back to Oswestry. Street. Tilly Mint had definitely made an impression. I took a few days to carefully and sensibly think about the realities of narrowboat life and what I wanted for the future before I decided that even though I had only viewed two boats, I wanted to make an offer on Tilly Mint. I travelled out to the marina the following Monday morning with my granddad to have a second viewing and then to make an offer. We parked up outside the marina and through the hedgerow I could see something that I really did not like. A sign on top of a boat proclaiming, under offer. We walked into the marina, and as we got closer, my fears were realised. The sign was sat on top of Tilly Mint. In that instant, I was absolutely devastated. I could practically feel my shoulders slump further with every step closer that we got. The strength of my disappointment also told me something positive. 
I really did, beyond doubt, want to live on a boat again. In all honesty, at this point, I was ready to just turn around, get back in the car and go back to Arthur Street. My granddad, however, insisted that I at least go to the office and declare my interest, just in case the sale fell through. As time will tell, this was a fateful decision. Well, talking to some of the marina staff, I was told that another 45-foot boat would be coming back on the market the following day, as the current purchasers had paid the deposit but failed to come up with the rest of the money. I was given the opportunity to go and take a look around the boat, and even though I still felt like I just wanted to go back home and sulk, I couldn't possibly not have had a look at the mystery boat. Within two minutes, I was stood on the stern of narrowboat Abel's Ark. Despite how much I love the boat now, I've got to be completely honest and say that it wasn't love at first sight. Due to the disappointment moments earlier, leading me to go from being on the brink of making an offer on another boat to literally having to put my grown-up face on and not have a big sulk. My mind was a bit clouded as I looked around. The fact that Abel's Ark wasn't as fresh or modern looking inside when compared to Tilly Mint was all I could focus on. After a few minutes on board, I left the marina, still with a heavy heart and dreading what could now be the start of a long search for another boat. It wasn't until the following few days that I started to consider Abel's Ark with a clear mind and realised that her layout was actually far more suitable for me than Tilly Mint, and as I looked at other boats online I started to see the value that the boat offered, especially with the brand new engine that had barely 30 hours runtime on the clock. The asking price of £30,000 was still far more than I wanted to spend as there were a few things on board that I felt may need work and attention, so I held back and continued to look at other boats. Curiosity got the better of me soon enough, and I returned for a second viewing, this time with a clear head and an eye for detail. I looked around and considered the practicalities of how I would live on board. The first things that were huge positives for the boat were the bow and stern covers. These substantial canvas coverings on what would have otherwise been entirely outdoor spaces added almost another 15 feet of weatherproof storage and seating areas. Although not as substantial as the actual proper indoor area of the boat, it can't be overstated just how useful having good covers over the front and back of the boat really is. Stepping down from the near 10 foot deck on the stern, I entered the kitchen and living area. Two small hobs were to the immediate left of the door with a small fridge beneath them. A sink and draining board on the leftmost wall with a cupboard and countertop creating a small U-shaped kitchen. The living area was open plan from this with a sizeable wood burner on the far side of the kitchen and a large sofa bed as the only real furniture. On the far wall from the stern door were some very narrow shelves that I could easily envision becoming a series of stationary storage areas. Past this wall was a small alleyway, which led past the bathroom, which was kitted out with a decent shower, pump-out toilet and sink and storage area. On the other side of the small alleyway was the bedroom, complete with double bed, wardrobe, cupboard and doors that opened up onto the covered bow area, which also had more seating and storage. Looking around this for a second time, everything started to fall into place in my mind's eye. The layout was good, the price wasn't too unreasonable, and most importantly, I actually really liked it. To respect the privacy of the sellers, I will summarise what happened next, but after a lot of indecision on my part, I finally phoned the marina and made an offer of £26,000. I received a call back and a counter offer of £26,500, which shocked me as I thought that the counter offer would be at least £27,000. I declined the counter offer and must admit that I expected a call back within a few minutes saying that they would accept my original offer. 
I didn't get the call and that ended up massively in my favour. I was disappointed not to have bought the boat, but I was adamant that I wouldn't pay more than my offer. As luck would have it, my dad was on holiday for a week, so the following day I went to stay at his empty house to look after the pets. The change of scenery allowed me to clear my mind and make peace with the fact that I'd missed out on buying a second boat, or so I thought. When a little while later I received a phone call from the marina asking if I was still interested, I played it cool and said that there were other boats that I wanted to look at. It seemed like the seller was now looking to sell quickly, whereas I had all the time in the world, or at least I acted as if I did. Within a week of that phone call, the price of the boat was slashed to £25,000. I couldn't believe my eyes. I then visited the boat for a third and final viewing, then went into the office and, against the advice of everybody around me who told me to just buy it outright after already having offered more than its new asking price, I made a low offer of £22,000, with the caveat that I could pay immediately if they accepted and would not ask for a whole survey, a move that would give the seller a quick sale. In return, I would get a cheaper boat, but take on the risk that I would potentially have to spend a lot of money on any work the hole needed. A few hours later, I received a phone call. I had just bought a boat. The following day, I returned to the marina, signed the appropriate papers, and then transferred the money. It was just a matter of waiting for it all to process. In the afternoon, my mum insisted on visiting the marina to see my new home. The 20th of April was an amazing day all round. The sun was beaming down out of a cloudless blue sky. I was happily taking measurements and plotting the sale of the small amount of furniture I had collected in the flat. And significantly, the boat got the approval of my mum, which was very important for everybody concerned. <laughs>